Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, learners, grade 12 life sciences, as well as uh, educators, maybe subject advice, advisors that is joining us this afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation, final examination prep for grade 12 life sciences paper one. Let us move to what I have in front of me, and that is the September trial paper that we wrote in the Free State. Uh, I'm going to go slowly enough through the paper so that learners can pick up uh, and remember what they have written and also maybe see it from another angle and maybe approach it differently when they get similar type of questions. Um, so let us move to the instructions and information first. A quick reference to that, learners and candidates. Um, these things are not put here for, for nothing they must be adhered to and many times learners do not adhere to these or they do not apply them and then um, they, they disadvantage themselves when it comes uh, to the answering of these papers. Now first of all you have to answer all questions in life sciences and you are now used to these life sciences papers. You wrote it since grade uh, 10. Um, you haven't written a June exam this year, we, we realize that but all tests and all exams in life sciences have the same format and the same breakdown when it comes to the sections. So you know that you have to answer all the questions. Secondly, you must write all the answers, of course, in the answer book that is provided to you. In the final exam, you will get an answer book and not lose sheets of paper. Thirdly, you start the answer to each question at the top of a new page. I'm not saying the sub-questions, I'm saying Section A, question 1, all the question 1 questions on, on one page. When you finish with that, you start on a new page with question 2. Answer all the sub-sections uh, of question 2, 2.1, 2.1.1, etc., 2.2, 3, 4, up to the end of question 2. Question 3, you start again on a new page and the same then with question 4. Number the answers correctly according to the numbering system, system used in the question paper. If the numbering system is 2.1.3, don't add Roman 1s or 2s or A, Bs or Cs, small letters, big letters, because it can, can become confusing. And let me tell you at this stage, candidates, it is your first final exam in life sciences. Um, markers don't want to see you using numbers and uh, symbols that is not part of the question paper itself because in the paper, in the answers, sometimes you will use a symbol, a, a, a capital A or a small a, uh, when it comes to questions, particular questions. Then if you use your own numbering system, it can confuse people and you, the candidate, will lose the marks. F number five, present your answers according to the instructions of each question. Does the question ask, draw a diagram, write uh, list, write a list, name, describe, explain, carefully read what the instruction is and can I say at this stage, every time, this is a hint, every time that you look at the question, describe three reasons why or this, um, explain the fact that, look at the mark allocation to also give you an indication of how much you should write down how much info is needed. If it's only one mark, normally it's one, it's, it's, it's a terminology or a term or maybe a short sentence. But when it comes to two marks, three marks, and of course five and six marks, it means that you have to write more. And you have to write facts to be credited with the, with the proper marks. Number six, all drawings should be done in pencil and labeled in blue ink or black ink. You make your drawings in pencil if any drawing in the life sciences curriculum is asked, you do it in pencil, use a ruler to draw your lines in blue or black ink, the same type of ink that you are writing in. Draw diagrams, tables or flowcharts only when asked to do so. Sometimes a question says, compare the following, compare the endocrine system with the nervous system in the following uh, aspects regards but they say compare they don't say draw a table then you do not draw a table if they say use a table to compare two things yes that's another story then you draw a table 
uh, let me take the example of a flow chart. A good example is the reflex arc. When you have to give a reflex arc, starting with the, let's say, the, the, the sense organ, the, the skin, the stimulus, uh, change into an impulse, and then sensory neuron, interneuron, etc. And they, and they say, use a flow chart. Then you can use arrows, words and arrows. But if it's not said flow charts, then you must describe, you must write out, write down your answer, physically. Otherwise, you, 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 are tend, you, you tend to, uh, to, to lose marks. The diagrams in this question paper are not necessarily drawn to scale. That is, that is many times the case. So a part of the ear, we will see later in this paper, there was a question on the ear. Um, not drawn, drawn to scale, so it is said here. So that you, otherwise, they will tell you, these diagrams are drawn to scale. Especially when it comes to paper 2, you will, you will hear on Friday when we do the exam prep for paper 2, that for paper 2, let's say when it comes to the skulls or the brains of, 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 of hominids, then the scale is important to see the difference between an African ape and, and, and the species of Australopithecus, for example. But in this paper, it also applies. Otherwise, they will tell you it is drawn to scale. Do not use graph paper. You won't use graph paper because it, 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 it's not being handed out to you at your, at your, mark, uh, your, your writing center. Very important, number 10. <coughs> you must use a non-programmable calculator, protractor and a compass where necessary. So bring these articles into the exam room. You are allowed. You are allowed to bring in a calculator. Not a cell phone with a calculator. That won't be allowed. But the calculator is fine. And then the protractor and the compass, whenever you need to draw a circular diagram or a pie chart, as we call it, then you will need both a protractor and a compass. And if at this stage you are not prepared or have done some exercises on drawing a pie chart, please get to it. In this paper later on, we will, we will deal with a, a bar, a, bar a, a graph. But uh, any of these other graphs, can, can be asked for, uh, to you. And then 11, I wrote at the back in green, NB, very, very important. <coughs> write neatly and write legibly. Leesbar in Afrikaans. Schrijf netjes en schrijf leesbar. Candidates, it's very important when you give an answer. I always share this rule, this internal rule that I have in between two answers. Leave a, a, a row open. Don't press everything underneath one another. You can even see in this typing, this format here, there's, there's gaps in between so that you can clearly distinguish between these sentences. Now do the same in your, in your answer script. Leave a, a, a row open between 2.1.1, 2.1.2, uh, etc. Work systemically so that, so that the, the markers can clearly see this is the answer of 3.1.2, and then there's a row open to 3.1.3, etc. So these instructions, candidates, very important to adhere to. Then, as I said, we are going to go deeper into the September trial papers, the prelims that was written in the Free State. Now read that instruction on top, and, and forgive me if I, if I spend time on, on things like instructions, but it's important. Friday when you write paper one, Monday when you write paper two, maybe you're in a hurry, maybe your time is running out, and then when you know these instructions, they will always be the same, then you have a good starting point. It says various options are given as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the answer and write only the letter. A, B, C, or D, next to the question number 111 to 1110. In this case, there was uh, 10 answers. There were 10 answers. Uh, sometimes there's 8, sometimes there's 9, sometimes there's 11. Read carefully, and then you write it underneath. In this case, do not leave rows open. You write 111. Let me do it on this, on this piece of paper. 111, directly beneath that, oh, goodness, 112. 113, etc. There it's not necessary to leave. Now between this and question 2.1, you can leave open, uh, a row open. 
sorry for pressing it in there, but I think you understand what I'm saying. And then next to it, you write the A or the C or the D underneath one another. Please, candidates, do not go in a row like that. One, one, one is there, one, one, two. You are going to lose marks. Make it as simple and as easy as possible for the examiners, for the markers. No, not the examiners, the markers to, to assess your script. Now let's look at the first question, and I've already indicated this is how I answer a paper. And I think it's a good hint to tell you that every time you read a question, you can use a pencil or a pen with a, with a ruler or whatever to indicate the key words in the particular answer. Now in this case, monoculture should be avoided. You have to know the definition of a monoculture in the part of the human impact on the environment. If you, and what I always do, I, I, I hide the answers, the possible answers I read. Monoculture should be avoided since it. And then I think, okay, what can they ask on monocultures? Monocultures are type of, of crops that are planted and grown year after year, the same type of crop in the same area. That's a monoculture. So what negative and positive effects does that have on the crops that is grown there? Now you can go to the distractors. Monoculture increases the population size of existing pests, which sounds true at this starting point. But quickly go through the rest. Increases biodiversity, that is not true. Decreases crop yield and increases soil nutrients. Now, the answer to this question is A. Because in monocultures, the population size increases of existing pests. That we know. And because of those pests, they will have an influence on the growing of those crops. There were some arguments about C, because in the notes it also says that a monoculture, when it is grown year after year, uh, it can, it can um, decrease the crop yield because of all these, because the pests that are there now can, can, can eat, can feed on these things and decrease the crop yield. If, so this is a very uh, uh, indirect way of, of, of looking at the question. But normally you look at the one that is the mostly correct and that is A. It, but as a matter of fact, we did credit in the, in the September prelim exam the, the number C. So learners that wrote A or C, we, 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 we did that. But normally these things have one answer. This is, it's only the exception on the rule that we go to maybe more than one. Next question was about the nervous system. <clears throat> and I want candidates to listen carefully this afternoon on how I argue when I, when I tackle a particular question. The nerve impulse in the axon of a sensory neuron is transmitted and then there's some options. What did I do? I like to learn and to study and to answer looking at pictures in my head or I put it on my, on my uh, piece of paper. Don't do this on your script. Please, don't do these type of things on your script. The, your script is only there for the answers. Even a, a rough answer, as we will we'll come to the essay later on this afternoon, even there, you don't write the, 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 the draft part of your answer on the, in, on the script. Do it on a rough. You can ask the, the invigilator. You need a, a clean uh, sheet of paper. So, there you will see the, the options on, on the nerve impulses in the accent of a sensory neuron. I underlined that. I underlined that to, to tell you that it's about sensory neurons. So, a sensory neuron looks like this. We all know that. Now it's about the axon. What, in what direction is an axon carrying the impulse? Towards the dendrite of the sensory neuron. Now when, when this is a sensory neuron, you first get on the one side the, 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 the dendrite, in this case only one dendrite. Moto, motor neurons have more than one uh, uh, dendrite. A lot of dendrites, that is, that's why it's also called a, multi, uh, a multipolar neuron. And then it has one cell body and it has one axon. This is a sensory neuron or a monopolar neuron because it only has one protrusion going there. Now the question is, the impulse 
is transmitted towards the dendrite. Now there's my arrow. If my impulse comes from there, there's the, let's do this, dendrite and axon. There are dendrites and one axon of a motor neuron. Now same here. Then you can clearly see the impulse going away from the den, den, dendrites towards the cell body and then away from the cell body to the next neuron. The answer, towards the dendrite of the sensory neuron. That is not correct. Towards the cell body of the sensory neuron. Nerve impulse in the axon of a sensory neuron is transmitted towards the cell body of the sensory neuron. That's there. It's not true. Away from the effector organ. It's also not true. Towards the cell body means there. Away from the cell body. There's the cell body with the nucleus. Away. There's the axon. The impulse is, is transmitted away from the cell body. And that is our answer. 112D. 113. Carefully read these questions on the human impact on the environment. Which one of the following is a consequence of the destruction of wetlands? The vernietiging van vleilande in Afrikaans. Some of the reasons could be it, in, it leads to an increased runoff of rainwater. Increased runoff of rainwater when, when there's no wetlands anymore. Increased biodiversity. No wetlands, poorer biodiversity. Smaller. Decreased. That's wrong. Increase in water availability. It's gone. So water available, there's less water available. And increase of water quality. No. The answer in this case, 113A. That was D. This is A. Why? Wetlands, when it is destructed, Will, will lead to an increased runoff of rainwater. In other words, rainwater won't be caught into these wetlands. They will just be lost. Next question. When you come across things like this, with these graphs drawn as, as options, be careful. Read the instruction, read this question very carefully. Which graph shows the effect of Pollution by sewage on the amount of dissolved oxygen. So there's a lot of key words in this question. Sewage. The, if, the, the effect of pollution by sewage on oxygen levels. And then you look at the possible graphs. First of all, have a good look at the, what is given in the graph. Y-axis, X-axis. On the X-axis... Distance downstream. So this, and, and, and the arrow means it's becoming further and further downstream. Let's say 1 meter, 2 meters, 10 meters, whatever. Distance downstream. And on the y-axis, it's the dissolved oxygen. Remember what it's about. Pollution by sewage. Now sewage and uh, nitri nit nit um, nitrogen type of, of, of uh, minerals, like in fertilizers, <coughs> and in compost and all those potting soil, you will have uh, lots of, of, of um, uh, nutrients there. So sewage and nutrients have the same effect on a, a body of water. And that is, it leads to algal bloom. A lot of algae grows there. Sewage is organic. It's organic uh, substances. But we want to know what happens to oxygen levels. Now we know that oxygen levels will decrease. Why? Because the algal, the, the lots of algae, will block the sunlight towards deeper laying organisms and they will start dying. And decomposing of them will lead to the use of oxygen, so oxygen levels will decrease. That is the, the general tendency here. Now you look for a graph that shows a decrease in oxygen over uh, uh, further away from the, from the source. So when you look at A, first of all, a lot of oxygen. And here, this arrow shows the sewage enters the river. There the sewage is, has landed inside the river. So after that, this graph shows there's a depletion of, of oxygen. And further downstream, then there's a slow increase until it levels again the initial 
level of oxygen. So this one looks very, very correct when you look at it. That one, very close. The only difference between this one and that one is oxygen first increases and then it decreases, but later on. So, so a little bit not uh, uh, more incorrect than what happens here. And then the last two, you can, you can totally el um, eliminate because this shows that oxygen level rises and then becomes constant again, which is totally wrong. That one shows oxygen level constant throughout uh, those distances from the source downstream. So the last two immediately you can, you can eliminate and then eventually you also eliminate that one. So 114 is your answer A. 115. During the development of the embryo, the function of the amnion, function of amnion, there's your keywords, and, and you can hide it and tell yourself, now what do I know about the function of, of the amnion? And you can mention a few and then you see if you find your answer. It serves as reserve food, it's not true. It gives rise to the placenta, it's not true because the, 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 the chorion and the chorionic villi Give, give rise to the placenta. It prevents the developing fetus from moving about. Totally untrue. Or it holds the fluid which protects the embryo against injury. Yes. 115D. And make sure in these multiple choice questions you read right through. Even if you decide like this one, my answer is A. Just check the rest to, do, to make double sure. Now they tell us 116 and 117 are based on the following diagram. And immediately you know this is about meiosis. And what I've done next to it, I've written, when, when I look at the first question here, I see they say identify the phases. So I wrote the, the first letter of the phases from top to bottom in the, in the order in which they, they take place. In other words, this stands for prophase, and then metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. If we add interphase, at the start of that, remember, interface is not one of the phases of meiosis. It's a phase in between two cell divisions. Then your teacher has told you the, the, the abbreviation IPMAT, I-P-M-A-T, IPMAT, to remember the, the correct order of the phases. So that is just background. Now, what do you see here? You see meiosis in a particular phase. You see there a part of a chromosome which immediately indicate to you that this must be meiosis 2. Because if it was meiosis 1, these chromosomes would have been close together, lying close together on the equator, as homologous pairs. But now they are single chromosomes, so it's meiosis 2. With centrioles, the, 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 the spindle fiber, no, not centrioles, the spindle threads, keeping them in place, forming part of the spindle. Your centrioles are, are the regions there at the at the two poles of the cell. But here is something strange. Instead of one chromosome that side and another chromosome, both, chromoso so both chromosomes move to the same side. So you must keep this in mind when it comes to the questions. Now let's look at the questions. First question is, there's two questions in this one. First question, identify the phase of meiosis. And then the, again, you can hide the, the, the phases and you tell yourself which one I would choose. I already said it's meiosis 2. Now we must just decide, is it, is it prophase, metaphase, anaphase or telophase? And, 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 and I'm saying it's anaphase because the chromosomes in meiosis 2 Remember, they, 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 have, they have arranged singly acro across this equator re region. Let me bring my diagram back. It has initially in meiosis 2 arranged singly along the equator, the chromosomes, and then the centromeres split and chromatids or daughter chromosomes move to opposite poles. And you can clearly see they have already split and they are already moving to the poles, except for the, there two of them move, but here only the daughter chromosome, which means that it's anaphase. It's not yet finished, and it's not lying on the equator, so it's anaphase 2. 
Then you go to your possible answers and you see, aha, D on a phase 2. And you mark, or you write down a number D on your answer script, 116D. 117, <clears throat> now we must come back to that situation that we saw on the diagram of one chromosome not split, that did not split. Identify the phenomenon. Is it crossing over? Definitely not. Is it non-disjunction? That sounds correct. But let's go through. Is it segmentation? There's no such thing in, in meiosis. Or is it a repeated interface? It's nonsense. So your answer, 117B. Next question, 118. An extract from a gland of an adult mouse was injected into the bloodstream of a young mouse. The young mouse's heart rate increased and its pupils dilated. Immediately, alarm bells must go. Heart rate, pupils. Heart rate increase, pupils dilate. It, it tells me something about one hormone in, in mammals and that is adrenaline. So have a look. Now the question is from which gland was that extract, extract obtained. If it is adrenaline, that I know it is, where does it come from? Hypothalamus, pituitary gland, adrenal gland, or thyroid gland? Answer is um, C, of course. It comes from the adrenal glands, adrenaline. So carefully, uh, they, they start with a gland, and then they move to the, the, what they anticipate is you must understand which hormone and then from which gland does this hormone come? Then 119 and 110 refers to, read the question carefully, refer to an investigation which was conducted to determine the effect of a drug on the reaction time in humans. In other words, it has to do with the nervous system. This investigation wants to know what is the effect of a certain drug on the reaction time. Does the reaction time increase? Does it go to get slower? Does it stay the same? Now the question is, what was the dependent variable in this investigation? It's another way of asking this type of questions. Now, how do I, de how do I distinguish between dependent and independent variable? You go back to your aim. The aim is to investigate which the effect of a drug. So this is the one, the effect of a drug that you are going to manipulate. You are going to change it. And then you're going to observe or measure reaction time in humans. Now immediately what I said, observe or measure, has to do with your dependent variable. And the change in the effect of a drug, so to, to test for the effect of a certain drug, you have to use different drugs or you, you manipulate this, this factor, this variable. So this is then the independent variable, and the reaction time is dependent. Now, where's my answer? What was the dependent variable? The drug? No. Time after taking the drug? No. The reaction time in humans? 119C. Seems to be okay. The number of volunteers has nothing to do with, with uh, dependent and independent variables. So my answer, 119 is C. Dependent variable is reaction time in humans. So you always go back to your aim to determine these type of answers. There I've just written the drug is the independent variable, the reaction time is the dependent variable. Things that has to, keep, has to be kept constant, like the type of, of, of specimens that you're going to use, boys or girls or adult people or children, that has to be kept constant, otherwise it will have an influence on your variables. Those are called constant variables or fixed variables. Now the next question, 10, that's the last multiple choice question, also all about this investigation. It says, the following factors were considered. Number of volunteers, time of day, repeat the investigation. The minute you see this, repeat number, there's going to be questions asked on reliability or validity. The investigation must be done over a long period of time. Now I go. The, these are factors given. Which one of the following combinations of those factors will affect the reliability? There it comes. 
And when it comes to reliability, there's two words that you must immediately be able to, 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 to say, and that is increase the sample size and repeat the investigation. Now you look for them. Where is repetition here? There it is, three. Repeat the investigation. Where is sample size? There it is, number of volunteers. Make it more. Have instead of 10 volunteers, you use 50. It will increase the reliability. So one and three looks fine. Time of day doesn't increase reliability. Long period of time, again, it's about time, don't, uh, does not influence reliability. So my answer is, is one and three, and now you must get it, you must find it here. And hopefully you're fortunate and you find it at number D, one and three only. So there's your answers for the multiple choice questions with a bit of an explanation to each. Give the correct biological term and remember Biological term does not have to be one word only. A biological term can be a, a collection of words. Two, three, four words can also bring about <coughs> a term. It's a concept. So don't get confused and always looking for only one word. It doesn't say give one word for the following. It says biological term. The first one. And I will at the end of section I show you the memo so that you can just mop up this question. Having access to enough food on a daily basis to ensure healthy living. <clears throat> it's food security. It's a definition of food security. Now how do you study these things? When you've started with your matric year, hopefully you've started keeping a, a glossary. You made yourself a glossary. And if you don't have yourself made a glossary, before you, when you, while you're busy studying, you go to www.mindset.co.za, mindset, M-I-N-D, mindset, go to cover, go to life sciences, it's the website that we are using as a, as a, as a subject together with natural sciences. And you go to uh, COVID-19 support under life sciences and you will find glossaries and mind maps of all the topics, even from grade 10 and 11 also. But the grade 12 ones are there. So take those sheets, print it for yourself or use it on your computer or tablet or even your cell phone and study the words and the definitions of different chapters, parts of the work. That one is food security. The hormone that prevents glucose from being secreted. It means the hormone that lower the level of glucose. So be also able to just put it in other words. Prevents glucose from being secreted means lower, lower glucose, less glucose. Which hormone? Insulin. Coming from the pancreas. Insulin. The type of protection where plants give off a sticky secretion to make it difficult for animals to eat the plant. It's one of the things that plants do, and it is called chemical protection. They also have mechanical protection when they use thorns or, 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 or things like that. But in this case, it's chemical of nature, so it's chemical protection. So you will get a, a mark for the word chemical protection. The hormone that ensures the production of milk, it's in, it's in the human reproduction, reproduction part, it's prolactin in, in females. The period between the ages of 10 and 12 years when human sex organs develop and start producing gametes, we call it puberty. The hormone responsible for regulating the concentration of sodium levels. It's a tricky one. Not all of us immediately know what sodium is about. It's salt. It's like, it's like sodium chloride, which is normal table salt. Um, so this is salt levels. Now, which hormone is responsible for controlling salt levels? Aldosterone. Also coming from the adrenal glands. But the answer here is aldosterone. They are the hormone. A disease caused when plague is formed between the neurons. It is that disease. You, you only have to study two diseases in the human nervous system. And that is Alzheimer's and uh, multiple sclerosis. So which one of the two is it? They are not allowed to ask you any other diseases because it's, 
it's stated in the in the examination guidelines and uh, the answer of course is Alzheimer's Alzheimer's disease long-term prevailing weather conditions of an area how we how do we say what is the climate of the free state what is the climate found in in, in KZN what is the climate in in Namibia it means the long-term prevailing weather answer is climate <clears throat> under human impact on the environment you will find that definition the type of development in birds where the hatchlings eyes are open and their bodies are covered with downy feathers it's either precocial or altricial that's those are the two now in this case when they can well are, are a little bit developed and can cope on their own in, in, in a big way we, we call it precocial development the other one with eyes closed they don't have feathers they can't walk they stumble around or they lie, the mother is, is feeding them, and then later on they develop, that is called altricial development. Let me quickly show you the terms that we have discussed. Food security, insulin, <coughs> insulin, chemical protection, prolactin, puberty, and the rest. There you find it. Let's talk about spelling errors. Spelling errors. If you spelt, let's say, uh, puberty, you spell with an I Puberty You will still get your mark Try your best to spell correctly, of course But When we can make out what you, what you meant And very importantly It does not have another meaning in life sciences Then we will give you credit for that Let's take another example Let's say one of these answers was Glucose Or Glycogen or glucagon, there you can immediately hear. You have to spell it correctly. Glucagon is a hormone. Glycogen is a carbohydrate. So it, is that, it has different meanings. So then the spelling becomes important. Next section. It's the section where you must indicate in column 1 and column 2 are both those answers correct? Only A, only B, both correct or none of them correct. And then you must indicate, you must write down in your answer book exactly what I'm saying. A only or B only or both A and B or none. Please use, follow the instruction that is, that is given there. The first one, the reaction of a plant organ to a light stimulus from one side. You can close it up and tell yourself, uh, reaction of a plant to a light stimulus, it's photo, photo, where it's phototropism. Now it's either positive or negative, they don't say, they say in reaction, the reaction of a plant. So it has to do with phototropism. Deutropism is the, uh, is the influence of gravity. So let's see, ah, there's my answer, phototropism. So you mark the, you write down the, A only. A receptor for hearing, if I close my answers, Receptor for hearing uh, in, in, in the ear, in the cochlea, it is the organ of corti. That's the receptor for hearing. So let's check. Oh, it's not there. They say rods and cones. It's none. Answer is none. Because rods and cones you find in the eye and not in the ear. Hearing is, 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 is um, dealt with in the ear. Thirdly, the process of discarding the uterus wall, which is accompanied by blood, if I close it up, I would say the answer should be menstruation. That is the process. Looking, ah, menstruation, there it is. Menstrual cycle, let's wait a bit, could it be both? No, the cycle includes a lot of other processes as well, and not only menstruation. So your answer is A. Only A. Only A. Only A, and there it is, none. One four, still part of section A. The effects of different plant hormones are illustrated by the diagrams. There's a diagram, there's another one, there's another one. And then there's questions. So first of all, when you look at this first, uh, this first diagram, it say, you can clearly see separation layer, yellowing of leaves. In other words, the falling off of leaves from, from a tree. There's going to be questions on that. This seed is germinating. There it starts growing. 
it breaks open the the testa, the, the 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 outer layer of the of the of the seed, and there it starts growing little small little uh, stems and and and, and uh, roots. So this is germination, and this diagram of two trees with leaves and stems, a pine tree and a maple tree. Let's look at the questions. They ask first of all. Identify the plant hormone responsible for the specific result in diagram A. So which plant hormone is responsible for, for the, the throwing down of leaves, forming that abscess, abscission layer, um, layer to, to, to literally break the, the, the force between the leaf and the stem? So the answer should be abscessic acid, but... It is also a function of auxins because the less auxins there is, it leads also to abscission. So you, have, you can write two answers there. You will be credited for either abscessic acid or auxins. And then the next question says, for diagram B, only one hormone, and that is gibberellins. Gibberellins are responsible for the germination of seeds. And then, next question, name the plant hormone responsible for the inhibition of the growth of lateral branches. Inhibition, slowing down of the growth of lateral buds. We all know that through apical dominance in diagram A, sorry, diagram A, the, the, the end parts there of the stem and even the root, if, if, if lots of auxin is there, it inhibits the growth of lateral buds and lateral branches. And that we call um, apical dominance. Auxin dominates the growth in the growth points. But, strangely enough, there's another hormone, again abscessic acid, which can also do that. Because in winter, abscessic acid causes the dormancy of buds. It means they are inactive. They wait for a better season to, to develop and to, to grow. So again, auxins or abscessic acid can be, can be asked. Name two places in plants where the hormone mentioned in 142 are produced. Now 142A can now be, it's either... Uh, auxins or abscessic acid and both of them they are they are uh, they develop and they are formed in the growing tips growing tips of stems or if you want to say the apical meristem of stems or the growing tips of roots or the apical meristem of roots you should have uh, and, and your your marks there give one more function of the hormone mentioned in question 142A. 142A, the answer was abscessic acid or auxins. Now, you will, you will be credited if you give other functions of the one that you mentioned. So if you mentioned auxins, let's go to the memo. If you answered auxins in 141A, then there are some other functions. For auxins, it can stimulate cell elongation. It can stimulate the development of fruit. Control of position is already mentioned, so this is not another function. So that's why I deleted it. Stimulate the development of adventitious roots in stem cuttings and cause tropism in stems and roots. Some other functions, only one will be marked correctly. Because it says give one more function. If you said, if you answered abscessic acid, then one more other function could be to contribute to the dormancy of seeds, or it inhibits germination, and it causes the closing of stomata. 143, question was, give two characteristics of plant hormones. They are organic substances, and they act as chemical messengers. It's the two obvious uh, characteristics.
then one five. There's a diagram of, I wonder if you know the name of this process, by looking at these diagrams. It is the formation of cells, it is meiosis, it says meiosis 1 and 2, but when it forms gametes, that, like you clearly can see here, it's about oogenesis, and they tell us, the diagram represents different stages in oogenesis in a female leopard that has a diploid chromosome number of 38. Now candidates, don't get a fright when a paper refers to other animals or plants or numbers that you haven't studied. It's about the principle that is, that is being tested here. You did, not, you did not mention the leopard, maybe in, in, your, in your matric class. You did not mention the chromosome number of 38. We, we many times refer to the chromosome number of 46, which humans have. But, but this is a new, it's a new question. And remember, a, a question paper is set according to different, what we call cognitive levels. And there must be questions on a higher cognitive level, which is what we, and then <clears throat> other animals are, are mentioned or other scenarios are mentioned. But if you know the basic principle, you will be able to answer these type of questions. So let's look at the, the questions asked from, from this particular um, diagrams. First question was, where in the female body does oogenesis take place? Where any, any mammal, where in the female body? It's either in the ovaries, okay, in an animal, it's not either, it is in the ovary. There's no other question. <clears throat> so your answer is ovary. And the next question, give the number of chromosomes in cell V and the number of autosomes in cell W. So back to our diagram. They tell you the mother cell has 38 chromosomes. In other words, 38 is the diploid number of chromosomes. That is why the, the mother cell, the starting cell there, has 38. But immediately we know it is reduction division. So these two cells, V and that one, has already half of 38, which is 19. And then from year to year, it tells you it's meiosis 2. Then this cell and that cell divides mitotically, or meiosis 2 is nothing else but mitosis, to bring about four gametes from one mother cell. And clearly you can see it's oogenesis, so it shows you three of them disappears, they degenerate, and one stays to become the ovum. Now they ask, I, take, I took a long route to come back to the question, number of chromosomes in V, I already said it, if that's 38, half of 38 is 19, so your answer should be 19. How many autosomes in, in W? So the total amount of chromosomes, if that one has 19, then these two also must have 19 chromosomes. But now you must know what are autosomes. Each and every cell in, a, in an organism has autosomes and gonosomes. So in the, in, the, in the haploid number, 36 of these chromosomes should be autosomes and two of them the sex chromosomes, the gonosomes, always. Now, if it is 36 autosomes, then half of, ach, th yeah, 36, then half of it is 18. In other words, in the, in the haploid cell, 18 chromosomes are autosomes and one is a gonosome. In the diploid um, scenario, 36 are autosomes and two, one pair of chromosomes are the gonosomes. So clearly you can see this question is on a higher level, which is necessary for our life sciences papers. 153. 
Name two processes that take place during meiosis one that lead to genetic variation in the cells that are formed. Two processes that can lead to genetic variation. Crossing over is one. And the random arrangement of chromosomes at the equator of the cell is another one. Crossing over the process where the, where the chromatids overlap and where the chromosomes arrange. As we already explained earlier in some of these other presentations, they can arrange initially the, the, bi, the, the, the homologous chromosomes can arrange in any way randomly and that after when the division starts, when meiosis carries on and prophase, metaphase and anaphase and even telophase, when there's, uh, when there's segregation of chromosomes, then uh, the variation comes about because of the random arrangement. Crossing over is the process where genetic material are swapped between different uh, chromatids. One five four. Explain one more reason why meiosis is very important. <clears throat> variation is one reason, so you can't mention variation again. So one other reason. Explain one other reason. It means you must give cause and effect. The chromosome number is halved. All the haploid gametes are produced. Let's start with that one. Chromosome number is halved. To do what? To ensure that the diploid chromosome number after fertilization comes about. Or a haploid gametes are produced to maintain a constant chromosome number in each generation. So there's the halving effect of meiosis so that the doubling effect of fertilization can happen. Can happen. End of that, end of section A. We are not going to break today. We are tackling section B of this September 2020 Free State Paper. Paper 1. Read the following extract. Now, I'm not going to read everything. You can, you can do it again if you have challenges with this question. They talk about a Snellen chart again. Don't get frightened when you see unfamiliar names. The question will be about the work that you studied. It will be about work that's in the examination guidelines. This is just a, a background given so that you understand it in the bigger picture. Now a Snellen chart is a chart like this. <clears throat> For those of you that have already went for an eye test will know. They show you this with a few meters between you and the chart and then you must read from top to bottom and the, the lower you can read, I mean the better your eyesight is. So this is a Snellen chart. Now they tell you a ratio of 20-20 like here are the smallest range that the normal human eye can, can see properly. And then they also tell you they use different uh, equipment, special equipment when, when, you, when you see this chart, so that the patterns and the arrangement differ, so that you can't um, memorize maybe a chart like this and then without seeing it, give the proper answers. Now let's look at the questions in this, in this section about this background. <coughs> Question one is, Now I the rest. During an eye test, a person moves from 6 meters from the chart to 3 meters from it. The minute you read that, the minute you read distance, change in distance from what you see, you must already know it is about accommodation. the accommodation process that happened in the eye. There's another one that we, that we call pupil mechanism, where the pupil diameter uh, dilates or, 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 or the diameter is, is getting smaller. This is about accommodation. So what 
questions do they ask? Name the process. There's my answer. Accommodation already. Name the process that enables the eye of the person to focus on the letters on the chart if it comes closer or moving away. Accommodation is the answer. Describe the process named in question 211A. For this person, be careful. They want you to discuss accommodation of an eye where the person moves from 6 meters to 3 meters. In other words, the distance is getting smaller. Then you must describe accommodation for objects coming closer to the eye. There's, there's, two, there's two ways dealing with it. Closer to the eye or further away. Now in this case, and now you must know your work. Ciliary muscles contract. The ciliary body moves closer to the lens. It, is, it has been um, explained to you in, in class. The suspensory ligaments slacken. For each of these things you get a mark. The lens becomes more convex. More refraction of light happens for a clear image to form on the retina. The opposite, when an object is moving further away, is just the opposite of each of these. Instead of ciliary muscles contract, you say they slacken. Less contraction. But ciliary body moves away from the lens, etc. So there's an answer for accommodation for this particular person. Any five, there's more than five answers, but the, the first five, if they're correct, will be, will be credited. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it says any five, so you can even write it later on. It doesn't say the five ways need. Anyway, can be can be can be given. All right. The next question, and of course, the number of marks five also tells you you have to you have to describe a few things here. Explain why one reason why the special equipment is used. I've already mentioned it. So that people cannot memorize the pattern or arrangement or sizes. Therefore, they need to rely on their eyesight and not their memories. Now, a question on binocular vision. It's also important to ensure what safe driving. What is binocular vision? Again, we are with our um, definitions. It's when images from both eyes are able to perceive a three-dimensional image. In other words, the images from both eyes goes through the, the optic nerve and in the brain, in the cerebrum part of the brain, it is interpreted as one picture, but to perceive a three-dimensional image. That is binocular vision. 213B, explain two reasons. Why binocular vision is important when driving a vehicle. I've um, colored this two reasons. Explain two reasons. It counts four. So one reason with the explanation will be two. Another reason with its explanation will give you the other two for four marks. Keep that in mind. How can that help your eye, uh, the, the, the person driving a motor vehicle? This be binocular vision. It provides a wider field of vision. It can improve the driver's driving ability or so his reactions. It creates a create a perception of depth that will ensure that the driver's ability to judge distance. So there's your one reason provides a wider field. Why? To do what? To improve the driver's ability to drive properly. It creates a perception of depth to do what? to ensure the ability to judge distance, for instance. <clears throat> that is the end of question 2-1. Then there's diagrams given and the background, background notes. When people becomes more, there's an increase in urbanization and industrialization. The resulting in people generate more solid waste. So this question is all about solid waste, part of the human impact. 
The average South African generates 0.5 to 2 kgs of waste daily. The average South African. <coughs> now this picture is just a background and maybe a better understanding of a landfill site. <coughs> and then comes the questions. Define the term solid waste. Again, it's a definition. You must know your definitions. Solid waste is any solid material that is of no use to humans. It's only counting one mark, so you have to give the whole sentence and understand the whole sentence for that one mark. Which greenhouse gases are released from this dumping site during decomposing of waste? So the waste are decomposed or busy decomposing which two gases, which, is, which are greenhouse gases, do we, do we uh, refer to? Carbon dioxide or methane are the two gases. <coughs> then another question on this topic. Name the negative effect of an increase in the gases mentioned. So if those two gases increase, the, the concentration in the atmosphere increases, what will happen? Negative effect. It's only one mark. And it leads to the normal greenhouse effect to the enhanced greenhouse effect. So your answer in this case is the enhanced greenhouse effect, two to three. That's the answer. Now, for only two marks, name two disadvantages of disposing solid waste in landfill sites. Now, there's a whole number of possible answers. And the poor markers, in this case, it makes life difficult. We know that, but that now learners can also see, candidates can, can see that we build in the alternatives. We give all the possible alternatives when it comes to, to, to marking these things. And there it is. It can, it, it's now disadvantages that has been asked. Name. Yeah, two disadvantages. The landfill site can attract pests. And that can carry a health risk. Let us quick. Nine two. You only nine two. Attracts pests, gives off bad odors, leads to urban decay, it can cause health hazards pollution and highly flammable methane can sometimes escape from the decomposing wastes. So there's a lot of disadvantages of landfill sites, if not managed well, of course. <clears throat> now, see the difference. Name two for two marks, but discuss two for four marks. Discuss two strategies. So you give the strategy and you describe it. Again, there's a few possible answers here. Look at all these answers. <coughs> that is strategies for solid waste management. Citizens can be encouraged to sort their waste into different waste containers to simplify recycling and reuse. Partnerships with recycling companies for improved collection of, the, you see, the cause and the effect, or the reason and the explanation thereof. A fine can be given to citizens, or you can penalize citizens who do not separate the waste into different bins, if it's given. You can charge or penalize people extra if they generate too much waste. So you're managing solid waste disposal. You can educate people to use organic waste, for example, to make compost. You can encourage recycling to make new products. You can encourage the reuse, such as glass, to reduce the waste produced. You can manage landfill sites. For example, you utilize methane plastic liners under the landfill, cover old sites by growing plants, or you can use it for recreational purposes or land development. So there's a lot of strategies. Two of them were marked 
with a reason, that's why it's 2 times 2, but look here, mark the first two only, so if you write 6 things, the markers are only going to mark the first two that you give, even if the sixth one is correct. They look at the first two because the memo says so. Why? Because the answer asks, give two or discuss two strategies. Look there. Discuss two strategies. So the first two will be marked. Wrong or right. Then there's another extract. Yes, our life sciences papers will have extracts that you must interpret. It's about Australian bushfires between in the season 2019-2020 that destroyed a lot of buildings and homes. And then they tell you uh, what happened also to the to the organisms in that in that area. Biodiversity uh, in this for, uh, forest are concentrated and then they are um, harmed. When forest burns, the biodiversity on which humans depend for their long-term survival also disappears. Now, what questions are asked? The bushfires led to a huge loss in habitat. Name one other way that can lead to a loss of diversity. Answers is poaching, alien plant invasions, or you can mention, you can give examples, any other factor that can destruct habitats. And then you can also give examples. Poor farming methods, urbanization, deforestation, mining, golf, etc. But this is, you can only give one of these for one mark. It's in any case only one mark. So either poaching or alien plant invasions or another factor with an example. If the example is mentioned, you will get your one mark. 232, again, discuss three reasons, you see, discuss three for six marks, why biodiversity is important to ensure, apology, <coughs> to ensure the survival of humans, 232, and lots of reasons given, how can biodiversity, meaning a variety of plant and animal species, how can that contribute to the survival of, of organisms? <coughs> Apologies. It can ensure food or fresh water for humans or, or nutrition because it can, it can be obtained from the environment. It, it, it serves as nutrition. Various plant species provide medicine to treat people with diseases or ailments. It's a source of fossil fuel which humans need to generate heat to survive, ensures that the climate is regulated and therefore foods are controlled, again, for humans to survive. You can't say survive because that's in the question. You must give a survival uh, strategy. It keeps diseases in check <clears throat> because predators eat sick animals, plays a role in the carbon dioxide and oxygen balance, so it ensures healthy air for humans for breathing. By providing forms of recreation and ecotourism, it contributes to human quality of life. All of these the reasons why biodiversity contributes to the survival of men and women. Of man in total, of, of, of people. <clears throat> we go to question 2-4. Interpretation of a graph. That will always be there. Either you must draw the graph or you must... Interpret the graph. Now I'm going to open it and I ask in the meantime while I'm taking a, <clears throat> a little time off to, to have a sip of water <clears throat> have a look at that graph and what is said on top and we will come to the, to the questions. Don't look at the question now. Just make sure you understand the background there. It says, thermoregulation <clears throat> is a process that allows your body to maintain its internal temperature. Nowadays, 
with COVID-19 and the regulations and the rules, uh, your, your temperature was, was measured many times. When you enter a, a building, a classroom, a school, ground, uh, a shopping center, your, your temperature was taken. So you know by now, your, your normal body temperature is somewhere between maybe 35, 36. <clears throat> normal body temperature, 36, around 36 point seven, eight nine, and 37. Higher than that, it's, it's not good news because then you, you, be, you become, you, you have a fever. And lower than that, salt, seldom happens, it's when you're in the real extreme cold temperatures. Now, what does this graph says? It says time in minutes, so it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30, 40, 50, versus body temperature and the fluctuation of it. But why is there fluctuation? Read this instruction th right through. Study the graph of a person taking a cold bath. That's the reason why his body, internal body temperature job dropped a little bit. Not even a degree, <clears throat> maybe a degree, from 37 comma something to 36 comma something. It, it, body temperature between small margins stay more or less the same, but then it can drop in cold conditions like a cold bath, or it can rise a little bit <clears throat> in warmer conditions, on, or when, when you're ill, when you have a fever, it rises. And then it, it, it um, recovers again to a constant temperature. So that's the background. Questions. According to the graph, what is the normal body temperature of this person? So you have to read that line. There is normal body temperature. As well as there, but if you put your ruler there, you must now read from this graph that measurement. So be careful. If I was you, if I were you, I would divide, take my ruler and divide this little axis even more into twos. 37, 2468 and then 38. Then it will be easier for you to read from this graph. <clears throat> so you know you want to know what that is, what 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 temperature that is. So it's 37, comma 246. It's more or less 37, comma, comma 8. But we were lenient when we come to marking. We credited any figure between 37,6 to 37,9. And the unit must be included, degrees Celsius. Second question, how long did it take for the body temperature to return to normal? <clears throat> so if you read it initially, I was also nearly trapped or tricked because to return to normal. Then you think, okay, this abnormal, return to normal. But remember, return to normal is from the second it becomes abnormal. From the second it starts going down, that, from there, up to the point where it recovered. That is the, the, the time in minutes that you need to give. <clears throat> so many people take it from there, so they say it's 10, 20 minutes. But no, what about these 20 minutes? So from the 10th minute, when it starts dropping, up to the 50th minute, when it is normal again, in between, of course, is 40 minutes. 50 minus 10 is 40. <coughs> so your answer, 40 minutes. Remember to give the unit. And then the question is, explain how vasoconstriction would ensure heat retention. Heat retention is keeping the heat constant. Vasoconstriction is the narrowing of blood vessels. There is a blood vessel and now suddenly it's very narrow. That is vasoconstriction. When it becomes wider, there is a blood vessel and suddenly it is now wider. That is called vasodilation. But this is not what this question is about. So you need to explain vasoconstriction to ensure heat retention. The 
<clears throat> the maintaining of, of a constant body temperature. So first of all, you have to say blood vessels become narrower. That is the constriction part. Less blood flows to the surface of the skin because of the smaller blood vessels, the thinner blood vessels, smaller diameter of, of blood vessels. Because of that, less sweat is also secreted and therefore less heat is lost. So you keep, you retain your body temperature. The opposite can also be asked when you want to release heat, when you want to give off, radiate heat, <clears throat> then it becomes wider, more blood flow, more sweat is secreted and therefore more heat is lost also to retain body temperature. Now, a question on homeostasis. Describe the negative feedback reaction that occurs in the body after the brain has detected a person is hydrated. If you don't understand the word hydrated, read on. And the blood has a high water level. So that hydrated means a high water level. Dehydrated means you have a low water level in the blood, in the body systems. <clears throat> so you must describe, and what is this negative feedback? It's a, it's a process where one thing influences the another. This is nothing else but homeostasis. Describe homeostasis for a lot of water in the blood. That's what it says in, 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 in simple English. So going to a memo, Immediately when it comes, it's about water, you know it's about ADH, the secretion of ADH from the pituitary gland. So you can start saying, less ADH is secreted because of this. By whom? By the pituitary into the bloodstream. The kidney tubules become less permeable to water, so less water is reabsorbed. Reabsorbed means back into the blood system, back into the body from these tubules. And the blood volume decreases. Remember, this person has a lot of water. He or she wants the, 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 the blood volume of uh, containing water to decrease. This is what happened. <clears throat> More water is now excreted in the urine. Or urine is less concentrated. That's the same thing. That's why there's a slash. So you, if you answer a question, you only have to answer that part. But... We make provision for, for candidates that, that, that write the alternative um, meaning. So this will also get a, a, a mark, but not another mark. Now water levels, because of this, in blood return back to normal. Look there, any four? Because it's just a discussion. There's more answers than, than needed. So any four can be marked correctly. <coughs> Moving on now to question three. Remember what I said in the beginning? You start on a new page with question three. Study the diagram below. The diagram is not drawn to scale. You can see that because it's the middle ear with the little ossicles there. And that's so small you can just see it with the naked eye when it is removed from the, from the middle ear. But this is a very a large diagram to explain, um, the, to, to give background to the, to the question that's going to be asked. So I've already mentioned the answer there. Which part of the human ear is represented by the diagram? It is the middle ear area. Write down the letter and name of the part that do the following. Parts that do the following. Each one will count two marks because it's letter and name. So you first write one of these letters and then next to it you write the name of the part that transmits vibrations to the inner ear. Be careful. Vibrations to the inner ear. There is the inner ear. So which of these membranes is responsible for that? That is the tympanic membrane. This is the oval window and this is the round window. So which of them transmits vibrations to the inner ear? It's that one, C. So your answer is C, oval window. 
Both of them get a mark. Which part converts sound waves to vibrations? From A, or from the outside, the sound wave, the sound comes in the form of a wave through the tympanic membrane that starts vibrating and that vibration is then carried over in to, to lead to vibrations of the ossicles. <clears throat> so the part that converts sound to vibration is the tympanic membrane. Please use the biological term tympanic membrane and stay away from a word like eardrum. Use the word tympanic membrane. <clears throat> Which part ensures that the pressure remains equal on both sides of the tympan tympanic membrane? Pressure on this side the same as on that side. Of course it's this tube. This number E. And that tube's name is the eustachian tube. Afrikaans die boys van eustachius. Eustachius met a wolf letter. Eustachian tube with a capital. <clears throat> because it's the surname of a person. Eustachian, Eustachius was the name or the surname of a person. That's why it's in a capital. The same with the organ of Corti. That Corti, capital C. Uh, the Isles of Langerhans. Langerhans was a person's surname. So that L is the capital L. 313. Name part B and describe its role in hearing. Five marks. Candidates, make sure you are able to describe hearing in full. You are able to describe balance in full. You are able to describe accommodation, pupil mechanism, how a person is able to see in full. And that will be five or six marks even. Now part B, they limit you to only part B. Name part B and describe its role in hearing. So let's see. 313. Now B, if you, if you name it, if you give a, a, a name for that label, <clears throat> it should be either ossicles, which is actually all three of them, or you can, mention, you can name only that particular one. It's called the anvil or the incus. So, three ossicles. So, B is an ossicle, but it's a specific ossicle with that name that we gave. So, you will get a mark for that. What does it do? It transmits and amplifies vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the oval window and then from the middle ear to the inner ear. So, that compulsory mark is for the naming of the part. And the other fee, four, other four is for the, is for the explanation. 314. A grommet is used to, for the treatment of a certain medical condition. <clears throat> you have to know also diseases and ailments when it comes to the ear and the eye, disorders or um, uh, situations. Name the specific condition where grommets are used. They are used due to infection in the middle ear. Middle ear infection is your answer. Where will grommets be surgically placed? A small cut is made in the, in the tympanic membrane and then placed there. Why? So that fluids from the, from the middle ear can drain through the ear canal. So that is where it will be placed. Explain why this procedure would be necessary for proper hearing. <clears throat> so there is the answer for proper hearing. Why is grommets, why are grommets needed? Due to the infection in the eustachian tube or in the middle ear, the eustachian tube cannot function properly. That's why air pressure on both sides of the, <clears throat> the tympanic membrane would differ, ear cannot be replaced, and then because of that, fluid accumulates in the middle ear cavity. It's also a higher order question, this one. The tympanic membrane is unable to vibrate because of that, and vibrations are not being transmitted to the overwind. So that influences hearing. If there's no vibration, then the, the sound wave in the form of an impulse won't be detected properly. That's the on four. Brings us to question 
It's a new sub question of question three. Background given endocrine system is, is, is made up of a, of a network of glands. These glands secrete hormones to regulate many bodily functions, including growth and metabolism. So they concentrate on two characteristics of uh, the endocrine system. The table below shows the variation in height in nine-year-old children. Do yourself a favor when you answer a paper like this. Also highlight or underline or, or show an indication where are the key words in the background and also in the questions. So this table is height. It's a range of heights, lengths of children, nine-year-old children. Uh, and, and it says it's in centimeters, 134, 5, 6, up to 146 centimeters. Number of children with, hundred, with, a, with a length, a height rather, of, of 134 centimeters, there's 10 children. So this was a survey. Then there's 15 with 135 centimeter heights, and etc. Only five children has a height of... 146, for instance. Questions. You must expect a calculation also here somewhere. And a graph, because it's a table. 3 to 1. Name one difference between endocrine and exocrine glands. Nothing, not nothing to do, but you don't have to get it from the information. Difference between endocrine and exocrine gland, easy. An endocrine gland secretes its, its hormones directly in the blood system. <clears throat> and the exocrine gland secretes its fluids in a cavity or even outside the body. And then another difference, you, you only have to name one, but let me mention another one. Um, it, uh, exocrine ex, ex, ex secretes enzymes while endocrine secretes hormones. Endocrine glands do not have ducts. They deposit or secrete the fluid directly in the blood system without a duct. But the exocrine systems, uh, uh, exocrine gland has ducts. So to show you the answer, different and, and, and again, remember what I said in the beginning, one of the instructions, if they don't ask a table, you do not draw a table. Otherwise, they are not going to credit your answers. So you have to write it out like this. First give the, the characteristics of exocrine gland and then the, the, if they say draw a table, then you draw a table. Exocrine left, endocrine right, one, two, three, one, two, three, and you compare. <clears throat> so any one times two, any one of these differences, in other words, and, the, and another thing, in, in, in the English language we say, Compare apples with apples. In Afrikaans, vergelijk appels met appels. You can your apple with a pear vergelijk. So if you compare secretion of one, then your difference must be also about secretion. And then you will get your two marks. You can't say the one has ducts and the other one does not secrete it. It secretes hormones. It, it doesn't, it's not apples anymore. It's different uh, entities. Three, three to two. Name the endocrine gland and the hormone responsible for the variation in height. <coughs> the hormone is the growth hormone. Where is the growth hormone secreted? From the pituitary. Or at the pituitary. We will still credit the word hypothesis, although the tendency nowadays is to move away from the word hypothesis to the word pituitary. In Afrikaans is it pituitary clear. <coughs> Either as the hypophysa. En onthou Afrikaans sprekende kandidate, moet nooit praat van die oordrom of die skuldklier nie. Dat is biologische woordname daarvoor wat jy moet gebruik. Tympanische membraan of tympane membraan vir die oordrom en tiroïd of tiroïd of tiroïd klier vir die skuldklier. Anders gaan hulle dit nie merk nie. So, the hormone, growth hormone or it's also called a somato somatotropic hormone, somatotropin. And the abbreviation will be accepted, STH. The same with the other hormones. 
LH and ADH, FSH, they will accept those abbreviations. They are biologically accepted words. Now, here's the calculation that we anticipated. What percentage of the children involved in this investigation is 140 centimeters tall? Show all calculations. It means you must set out your little calculation. First of all, you have to know what, what are the total number of learners here. <clears throat> because you need the total to determine a percentage. So you, 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 you total all these at the bottom. 10 plus 15 plus 20 plus 30. And it will give you a figure of 425. That is the total. 425 learners was part of this investigation. Now of those 425 how many of them had a, a height of 140 centimeters? 75. So it's 75 out of the 4 to 5 learners times 100 gives you the percentage. So there's your little calculation. 75 divided by 4 to 5 times 100 equals 17,65. Now we all know a learner cannot be 17 and a half learners or 17 and a comma six five learners but that is the answer so it's a percentage remember it's not number of learners that's why the decimals was were accepted <clears throat> it's a percentage of learners that can be comma six five now normally you round it off to one decimal so you can even write seventeen comma seven the suggestion is if if it goes on round it off to, to two decimals and you will be safe Otherwise, uh, do you now round up or do you round down, uh, downwards? Keep to two decimals, then you're okay. 17,65, and remember the percentage sign. <clears throat> now for six marks. Draw a bar graph to illustrate the information for the heights 137 to 142. That's a very important sentence you must draw a graph but not of all the information only from 137 it's there up to 142 there you only have to draw a bar graph <coughs> of that part of the table so you go to the to the to your sheet of paper and you draw a bar graph like this Please use a ruler to draw your x-axis as well as your y-axis. Div divide the x-axis into equal parts, divide the y-axis into equal parts. So that when you draw the bars with a pencil, of course, the width of the bars must be the same right through. And the spaces in between, that doesn't matter, the starting space is fine. The spaces in between the bars must also be equal. Then your scaling will be correct for the x-axis. And you, you write down the, 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 the label, height in centimeters, and then 137, 138, etc. And here the number of children also equal. Equal spaces. So that you... And how do you determine the, the range? What are the maximum number of children? Maximum number is 75. There's no higher number than 75 here. You see that? So the last, the, 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 the maximum, the highest number there must be 75, and in this case 80, which is fine. And then here on the, on the, on the x-axis, you just indicate the ranges. 137, 138, 139, the ranges of heights that you must indicate. And then you plot the range 137, 30 learners. So you take your ruler, you go up here on the y-axis, I'm off screen. You go there, next to or in line with 30, you make a mark on top of 137. Make yourself a little line or a mark with all of these to show what is the max there. And exactly in line with the bottom ones. And then you take your ruler and you draw bars. You, you draw bars of the bar graph. 
een staafgrafiek in Afrikaans. Of een kolomgrafiek. Maar ik denk die meest populaire, meer populaire woord is staafgrafiek. Wat is de difference between een baargraf en de histogram? They can ask the same type of question, but then they say histogram. Then, the, these, then there's no spaces in between. They're all together. So the next one that goes there sits right next to that one. And the next one up to 60 right next to that one. That is an histogram. All these bars are, are fit next to one another. In the same way, you must be able to draw a, a line graph. And as earlier said, you must also be able to draw a pie graph using your, your compass and your protractor. <coughs> now the key for marking graphs looks like this. It's out of six, the, the max. But teachers, I'm sure, have, have told you that we are looking for the type of graph for which you will get a mark. Also the title of the graph, and the title must include both variables. Then a correct scale for the y-axis, and in the, and, and, and the same, same mark, correct scale for the x-axis. <coughs> then labels, correct for the y-axis, oh, sorry, there's the y-axis, number of children, the label, and if there's a unit like centimeters, height, in brackets, centimeter. So there's the labels for y and x-axis. And then the plotting. The markers look at your plotting, and if you're plotting, and remember you have to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's only 6 <coughs> bars drawn, and if the plotting of all 6 are perfectly correct, you will get 2 marks for this part. But if 1 to 5 are plotted correctly, and the last one might be incorrect, you can still um, obtain 1 mark. So there's a little rubric to assist the markers in, 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 in marking this graph. In total then, if you, it's one, two, three, four, maximum, two year, five, six, six marks for the graph. And that is mostly what all the graphs will count <coughs> in an exam paper. We are nearly, we are nearing the end. This is the second, this is the last question of section B. Study the human male reproductive system below and answer the questions with labels given there. Nice big diagram of the male reproductive system. Questions identify part B and identify part H. B is the seminal vesicles, only one of them indicated there, and H of course is one testis. <clears throat> Singular form T E S T I S, plural form T E S T E S, testes. So there's that to those two answers. What is the function of E? You don't have to give the name of it, you just give the function of that part. And because we know it is the urethra, <clears throat> in males, the urethra transports both urine as well as sperm. Sperm are in the semen to the exterior. 333, three, three. look at this question. Discuss two structural adaptations. Two times two will be four. Two structural adaptations of the sperm cells to do what? Reach the ovum in the fallopian tube of the female. So it's not Adaptations of a sperm in general, it is to move, it is to reach the ovum. That's why we say read your questions carefully and, and mark or underline or encircle the keywords. <clears throat> so that sperm looking like that, and again, my little diagrams are not drawn to scale at all. These things are miniaturely small and the ovum. So the sperm will, wants to get to the ovum. So what adaptations does a sperm cell have to do that? <clears throat> it's about the sperm that has a neck area with a large amount of mitochondria. And this mitochondria will produce or provide energy for the sperm to move. The sperm also has a tail which propels the sperm or make movements 
so that the sperm could move to the fallopian tube. Cause and effect. Mitochondria for energy. Tail for movement. 334. Test results show that the man has a low sperm count. The doctor advises the man that when he's working on, the, on his laptop, and that's all, the laptop, the word laptop says, where do you use it many times? On your lap. It radiates heat that he should not put the laptop on his lap. It could be, um, has a negative effect on sperm production. <clears throat> now the question is, why do you think this could have an influence on fertility? So it's a, it's a, a detour that this question takes to bring you to the answer of infertility or an influence on fertility the laptop on the lap so that's the everything to do with the role of the scrotum ne? where is my memo now no oh. <coughs> Remember the scrotum, the function of the scrotum is, there it is, is to keep the, the sperm a little bit below body temperature. About minus two degrees, one to minus two degrees below body temperature, not below, not two degrees below, that's, freeze, that's below freezing point. Um, body temperature, as we said earlier, let's say it's 36,5. <clears throat> now, two degrees lower than that is 35 or 34,5 maybe. That is where the test, uh, the, the, the test is wants to be, and that's the role of the scrotum. So what can happen? The laptop radiates heat to the body. The temperature of the test is will now be higher than it has to be because the scrotum cannot function normally. And you're also in a sitting position, so it, it doesn't contribute to the scrotum do, doing its work. Sperm production will not be at an optimum, in other words, poor, poor sperm production, therefore producing less sperm, or sperm with a low quality even. And that all, you must answer the question. The question says, influence on fertility, which reduces the change of fertilization, chance of fertilization, or decrease fertility. This, this could actually be a, a compulsory mark, the last one. <clears throat> so learners should have answered the question or put the, the answer on top and then explain why. So there's a lesson to learn in answering a paper and using laptops. <clears throat> last question is the essay. Now let's tackle some some skills in answering an essay question and in this case it came out of the um, vertebrate reproduction reproduction strategies in, 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 in mammals <clears throat> now first of all when you get to your essay the first hint I want to give you is make sure you have enough time left some candidates start with the essay I'm not a big fan of that. Start with the essay so they know it's done and then they carry on with, with section A and B. You can do it as you wish. But make sure you have enough time. I would say more or less 30 minutes for the essay at the end. You, you are writing a two and a half hour paper so for two hours you, you keep yourself busy with section A and B. Make sure you have at least 30 minutes. 20 minutes maybe you also can get away with it but I would say 30 minutes because you want to read you want to make a draft or a rough explanation on a rough piece of paper and then you still have to write it over into your into your, your answer script that is the first hint enough time second hint you underline or encircle key words because an essay normally consists of subsections. Now unfortunately you don't know what the subsections value is. 
each subsection's value. But at least you can break it up into subsections and then you discuss it under your subsections to make it in a logical order, to produce, uh, present it in a logical order. Now let's see if we can identify key words. Reproductive strategies in animals such as viviparity in mammals optimize the success of reproduction. So this question is about <clears throat> animals that bear their, their young alive. The, the young are born alive. That is the, the meaning of viviparity. Now what must we do? This is just background. <clears throat> you must describe how viviparity and parental care contribute to the survival of animals. Also discuss the function of the placenta. It's a, it's a complicated context in which this question was put. Placenta in the development of the fetus. There's the last key word. So I will break up my essay into viviparity. How does it contribute to survival of animals? <coughs> Sorry. Parental care. How do, so my, my subsections is viviparity when it comes to survival. So you can make yourself a little scheme like this. My second subsection will be parental care. <clears throat> How does that contribute to, no, let's write it out, survival. And the third part of my essay is the function of the placenta or functions of the placenta when it comes to the development of the human fetus. There's my subsections. Now some people draw mind maps as, as draft the rough thingies <clears throat> and then work from there. So you can write down what you know about viviparity, maybe define it, and then describe how it leads to survival. The same with parental care, and then of course the placenta, and it's about the functions. The functions of the placenta. So there's maybe one function, another one, another one. So you can write it here, and then you start discussing. You take the first one, make a heading, write vivip viviparity. Make a heading, discuss it. Make a heading parental care in your essay, underline it, and discuss it. And lastly, make a heading functions of the placenta, underline it, and discuss it. It makes it easier for you to answer, and of course, it will simplify the marking process, and in the whole process, you are benefited. When a marker marks, when he, when he understands what you are writing, he doesn't have to look for answers and pick here and go and turn the page and, and look where did you... Uh, complete a, a particular context. If it's in order, uh, a logical order like this, it makes life easier for everybody. <clears throat> so, looking at the possible memo, look here, the memo also, the marking guideline, nicely divided into the subsections. So, there's some answers for viviparity. Internal fertilization takes place, that's an advantage. So that successful transfer of, of, of gametes form uh, um, take place for fertilization. Embryo develops internally <coughs> so that the environmental conditions is good and predators cannot come and, 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 and prey on the, on the embryo. And then nutrition takes place through the placenta which also increases the chances of survival. Now, of all these things, you only, well, you will write everything, but the, the marker will credit you with any three of those given. As I said, unfortunately, you don't know the values of all of these subsections in, 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 the, in the essay. So, my suggestion is you write everything you know about the particular topic 
if it is in line with the question. In other words, when it is about survival in this case. Same with parental care. Young of animals need parental care that ensures protection against predators. It uh, provides food, it provides heat, <coughs> and the little one cannot survive without this. Because a mammalian young is altricial, helpless at the beginning. <coughs> Only two marks for this subsection. Now, for the functions of the placenta, there's five possible functions. The marking guidelines say, mark any four of these functions. In other words, you give the function plus a description or an explanation of the function will give you two more marks. So for all of these functions, you will get a maximum of three for each. Three for each, there's five. Only four will be marked. Three times four is 12, plus those two gives you 17, which is the total of an essay. So there's the functions of the placenta. It gives nutrition to the embryo. I'm not going to read everything. Nutrition, discussed. Excretion, the excretion of metabolic wastes. How does that happen through the placenta? Gases exchange. How does that happen through the placenta? The roles of the placenta in, in, in uh, exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen. <clears throat> it acts as a microfilter to prevent the entry of pathogenic organisms and antibodies. And then lastly, it serves an endocrine function where the placenta takes over the function of the corpus luteum by secreting progesterone. So, all in all, your essay is then worth 17 marks for facts. You can't get more than 17 for the facts given. And then the last three refers to this um, little rubric that explains the marking of the essay. And the criterion are always the criterion are always the same. Criteria are always the same. This general criteria and then in this particular essay. Then it is divided into relevance. Was everything, where everything that you wrote, was it relevant? Did it follow a logical sequence or pattern? And the comprehensiveness. In Afrikaans praat ons van die volledigheid van die antwoord. The comprehensiveness. Did you cover all the important facts? So if Nothing is irrelevant. In other words, let me take an example. You had to, you had to explain <clears throat> these things. Let's say you have explained now something on, on ovovipary. Or ovipary, rather. Birds lying eggs. It's totally irrelevant. You won't get this one then. Right through. So... You must be relevant right through in your answer. Parental care as well as the functions of the placenta. Let's say everything is relevant so up to there, but you mention a few functions of the umbilical cord. Then you will lose the mark for relevancy. <clears throat> um, logical sequence, I've already explained. You have little headings that breaks the, the essay up into headings and you explain each heading on its own. Then you are busy working in a logical sequence. So the, four, the three things of this essay was answered in a logical order, you will get your mark. And then lastly, we, make a, 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 we break the, the mark allocation down to say for comprehensiveness, for vivipary, you must at least get two out of three. For parental care, at least one out of two. And for the functions of the placenta, at least eight out of a maximum of 12. And when you have those, two plus three plus eight is 11. So when you have at least 11 in this, in this regard, in this way, you will get your last one mark. <clears throat> so those three are the marks that, that are called the synthesis part. The synthesis part. And you can contribute to that. You can contribute to um, 
make your essay look like it should be. Right. So that brings us to the end of the essay. Maybe we can go back to the camera view. And I want to, to tell learners that uh, you must take special care in preparation of paper one. Grade 12 learners, this is your last opportunity. Uh, study hard. Some of you might not even go further with biology or life sciences in life. But I think you can all say that it was a very valuable subject to, to have. You learn more about yourself, about the environment, about animals and plants. And all I can say is study very, very hard. When you study, I mean, I'm not going to go to study tips now, but the best way to study life sciences is to sit at the desk and write. Sit at the desk, take a pencil and make drawings. And you, you saw how many drawings I used in this, in this paper to understand myself, to understand things better. Make use of drawings and repeat, repeat the facts. Some of these things you must study by heart, like accommodation of the eye, pupil mechanism, how do we hear, a reflex arc. A reflex arc was not at all touched, except for that one, few functions of the, of the uh, part of a, of a neuron. But I know you know your reflex arcs. Remember the action is when you pull the hand away, that's the, the action, but the arc is the pathway of the, the nerve impulse until a reaction happens. So those are things that you must know by heart. That when you see it, you just start writing. Make sure you identify the correct part of that uh, uh, answer that you must give. And um, all we can say from our side is everything of the best. Study hard, as well as for the, the last, the, the second paper, uh, paper two that's coming up. Now coming Friday afternoon, we will also have a presenter that presents the same type of thing. Maybe the, the September trial paper. In a, in a manner like this as to prepare yourself for paper two. So from my side, everything of the best. Thank you for teachers, subject advisors, learners in this very difficult year that you, that you raise your hand and say, I'm not going to let myself be disadvantaged by all these factors and I'm going to show myself and my teachers and my parents that I will perform well in life sciences. From my side, Thank you and goodbye.